Disclaimer. Before we dive in, I want to make one thing clear, I'm not a professional chef, just a regular person like you. My dishes might not win any beauty contests, but they're all about creating delicious dishes that satisfy your taste buds and cravings, not Instagram-worthy looks. I'm here to experiment with recipes and try out new products, keeping it real with you. So, with that said, let's get started. What's up? Welcome to Am's Kitchen. Today, I'm stepping away from my usual workout videos to explore something different. A while back, I created a YouTube short titled, Transforming Your Diet, Three Steps to a Healthier You Part 4, where I discussed the importance of creating your own food, rather than relying on store-bought products. Am's Kitchen is all about helping you create recipes for your favorite foods while maintaining your health and well-being. Whether it's about reducing calories, hitting your macros, or making an authentic version of a dish without artificial chemicals, we've got you covered. Health should be accessible to all because we all deserve to live a happy, healthy, and fulfilling life. In today's video, I'll be experimenting with Timu products to see what kind of recipes we can whip up. I'll give you my honest opinions about the products and provide some tips to customize the recipes to suit your tastes. Let's get started. I know many of you are huge fans of Chick-fil-A fries, so today, I'm going to take on the challenge of making them at home. We're going to use the products I've introduced to help us achieve that iconic waffle fry look. But, before we dive into the cooking process, I want to stress the importance of hand protection when working with sharp objects. Trust me, I learned this the hard way, and I'll spare you the gruesome details. Thankfully, days later, Finally being able to edit this video, I'm fully healed. As you can see, it was a bit tricky for me to put on the hand protection, but it's a small inconvenience compared to the importance of safety when handling knives and other sharp tools. I've noticed that the potato lattice waffle maker produces beautifully waffle-shaped fries. However, using the crinkle cutter has proven to be a bit challenging for me. To improve my technique, I scoured YouTube for tutorials on how to use it properly to create both crinkle and waffle fries. Maybe you'll have better luck mastering it, but it's safe to say I had my fair share of struggles. Moving on to the vegetable chopper, it does the job, but there's a trick to achieving those perfect waffle fry shapes. You'll want to rotate the potato a quarter turn after every cut to get that classic waffle fry look. I've come to realize this after a bit of trial and error, I even watched some YouTube tutorials after making this video. Perhaps I'll create another fries recipe video once I've mastered the technique. But, in the end, it's no big deal, they'll still taste like delicious fries, even if they don't have that perfect waffle fry appearance. Moving on, let's fast forward through all my earlier, somewhat comical attempts at cutting the potatoes, and get to the next step. We're not going to fry them to keep things lower in calories and healthier, but you certainly can if that's your preference. But before we do that, we're going to try something new, or at least it's new to me. We're going to boil all the potatoes, not cooking them all the way, just halfway through. This step will give our fries a slightly softer interior while still achieving that crispy exterior when we bake or fry them. Trust me, it's a game changer. I'm never looking back after trying this method. After you've added enough water to the pot, place the potatoes in and add vinegar and salt to taste. I don't measure, I just eyeball it. Make sure to consistently check on it. You'll know they're done when you can feel the texture with a utensil, and they're getting close to being soft. When they reach that point, take them out immediately. I don't have a specific time or temperature to give you because, like many people, I tend to cook by feeling and instinct rather than following strict instructions. It's all about that, cook's intuition, right? Next, I'm going to bake them, and I'll also be using the air fryer, setting it to air crisp. It's essential to keep a close eye on them to avoid overcooking, as I sometimes tend to do. So, watch them carefully during this step to achieve that perfect level of crispiness. And there you have it, the potatoes are done. You may find that some need a bit more time to cook, but the ones that are finished will come out crispy and delicious. I've been making them for lunch for my siblings, and they can't seem to get enough of them. 
Plus, I've been experimenting with using these delicious fries in various recipes as well. Next up, we're diving into the world of chocolate making, both white and milk chocolate to be precise. We'll start with white chocolate, and for this, you'll need one tablespoon of melted coconut oil. However, if you prefer a more authentic chocolatey taste, you can use cocoa butter. Personally, I favor coconut oil for its versatility, affordability, and the numerous health benefits it offers. Coconut oil is a fantastic choice because it's not just good for creating chocolate, it's also packed with health advantages. It's known to boost heart health, support weight management, and even improve skin and hair health. Plus, it's high in healthy fats and has antibacterial properties. So, it's a win-win when it comes to taste and health. After that, add 1 tablespoon of milk powder. It's important to note that you should not use actual milk as it can negatively affect the chocolate's texture and consistency. Next, include 2 tablespoons of powdered sugar. You can adjust the sweetness to your preference by adding more, but I've found that this quantity strikes a nice balance. Taste as you go to find your sweet spot. If you don't have powdered sugar, you can use regular sweetener, but keep in mind that powdered sugar is ideal for creating a smooth, fine texture that blends well with other ingredients. It also dissolves more easily in liquids, which is essential for this application. Here's a crucial tip, avoid using sweeteners that contain saccharin, acesulfame potassium, ACE-K, and aspartame. These ingredients can impart a bitter or metallic aftertaste, similar to the taste of baking soda. It took me lots of trial and error to discover this, so please check your sweetener labels to ensure they don't contain these substances. As an optional but highly recommended step for a flavor boost, you can add 1 teaspoon of vanilla extract and a dash of salt. These will enhance the overall taste of your chocolate filling. Now, take a look at this fantastic chocolate mold, it's one of my favorites because it gives our chocolates that elegant, store-bought appearance, just like those assorted chocolate boxes. Once we've filled these molds, we'll move on to making the milk chocolate. Before you proceed, it's important to remember to place something solid underneath the mold. The mold's flimsy nature can lead to spills of the chocolate filling, so you'll need a sturdy surface to carry it around without any mishaps. For the milk chocolate, the recipe is pretty much the same, 1 tablespoon of melted coconut oil, 1 tablespoon of milk powder, 2 tablespoons of sugar, and an extra 1 tablespoon of cocoa powder. To enhance the flavor, you can add 1 teaspoon of vanilla extract, a dash of salt, and 1 quarter teaspoon of coffee powder. Mix it all together until it's well combined, and then pour it into the molds. Now, it's time for the waiting game. We'll pop these in the freezer for at least 1 hour, though it might take longer depending on your freezer's temperature. Would you just look at that? It's incredible how these chocolates turned out, the white and milk chocolate shapes are just out of this world. I'm genuinely thrilled with the results. And, they not only look fantastic but taste amazing too. Even though I'm not a huge fan of coconut oil, I'm completely surprised at how addictive these chocolates are. I must admit, I'm a bit biased because, well, I just love chocolate. Sorry, but it's true, chocolate is simply irresistible. Now, let's dive into making some delicious chocolate chip muffins. To get started, you'll need 2 tablespoons of unsalted melted butter Half a cup, 120 milliliters, of milk 1 cup, 125 grams, of all-purpose flour a quarter cup, 50 grams, of sugar. One and a half teaspoons of baking powder. One quarter teaspoon of salt. Before adding the egg, here's a tip. Give the batter a little taste to check if it's sweet enough for your liking. Then, add one egg to the mix. Finally, incorporate one third cup, about 60 g, of chocolate chips. Don't worry if you don't have chocolate chips on hand. Remember, we made chocolate from scratch earlier. You can simply chop some up and add it to the batter. Voila! If you like, you can add 1 half teaspoon of vanilla extract to enhance the flavor. Unfortunately, 
I didn't have any on hand, which is why I didn't include it in this recipe. I'm using a pink silicone muffin pan to hold the batter. It's essential to note that you should only fill the batter halfway. Overfilling can lead to spillage, as I learned the hard way. Although I knew better, I wanted to cook everything all at once instead of making two batches. It's a good reminder to prioritize caution. Now, it's time to pop those muffins into the air fryer. Be sure to check on them periodically to ensure they're done. I understand they might not win any beauty contests or look as appetizing as store-bought muffins, but believe me, they taste fantastic. In fact, they were so good that my brother devoured them all on his own. It just goes to show that appearances can be deceiving. As they say, don't knock it till you try it. Give it a shot. Next up, we're taking on the challenge of making delicious glazed donuts. To get started, gather these ingredients. 2 tablespoons of melted and cooled unsalted butter. 1 cup of all-purpose flour. A quarter cup of sugar. Half a cup of plain yogurt. 1 and a half teaspoons of baking powder. 1 quarter teaspoon of salt. 1 quarter teaspoon of ground nutmeg. 1 half teaspoon of pure vanilla extract. Now, if you don't have vanilla extract on hand, don't fret. As I mentioned earlier, I didn't have vanilla extract either, so I use vanilla flavored yogurt, improvisation is the name of the game in the kitchen. And here's a pro tip, before adding the egg into the mix, be sure to taste the batter to make sure it's to your liking. Let's make these donuts extraordinary. After thoroughly mixing the batter, it's time to pour it into the silicone donut mold. But remember, the mold is a bit flimsy, so you'll want to place something sturdy underneath it for support when transferring it to the air fryer. When filling the molds, make sure to fill them only halfway to prevent any spillage. While the donuts are baking, let's whip up the glaze. Head over to the stove and grab a pot. In it, combine. 1 cup of water. A quarter cup of your preferred sweetener. A quarter cup of milk of your choice. 1 tablespoon of cornstarch. Give it a good stir to ensure everything dissolves and there are no lumps in the mixture. As it thickens, turn off the heat and allow it to cool. You'll notice it getting thicker over time. The donuts are finally ready, and well, they might not look like traditional donuts at first glance. The front side may not be the most appealing, but if you flip them over, you'll see they're perfect donuts. The front might have a unique texture because we poured the batter into the molds without smoothing it out, resulting in those distinctive streaks. But don't worry, it all adds to the charm. Now that the glaze is also ready, you have two delightful options, drizzle the glaze over the donuts or dip them for an extra burst of flavor. And let me tell you, just like with the muffins, my brother couldn't resist and devour them all. That's how good they are. I'd love to show you some proof, but just like me, he's a bit camera shy. Now, for our final recipe, let's tackle homemade Oreos. Here's what you'll need. A quarter cup of softened unsalted butter. Half a cup of all-purpose flour. A quarter cup of sweetener, you can choose your favorite. A pinch of salt. Two tablespoons of cocoa powder, although dark cocoa powder is recommended for that classic Oreo dark color. Optionally, you can add a touch of coffee powder and one quarter teaspoon of vanilla extract to elevate the flavor. As you work on molding the dough, Keep in mind that if it feels too crumbly, you can add a bit of water, but be cautious not to make it too wet. If that happens, don't worry, just add a little more flour to balance it out. It's all part of the baking adventure. Now, let's transfer our dough into the Oreo mold, and then we'll pop them in the oven. Take a look at these cookies, they may not have that iconic dark color like classic Oreos, but that's okay, we're still in for a treat. Now, for the filling that's going to make our homemade Oreos truly special, you'll need 2 tablespoons of cream cheese A quarter cup of powdered sugar, adjust to taste 1 quarter teaspoon of vanilla extract Unfortunately, 
I only had strawberry cream cheese on hand, and I wasn't quite ready to use it for this. So, I opted for Cool Whip, which is lower in calories, and let me tell you, the Oreos turned out incredibly delicious. They may not taste exactly like the original Oreos, but they come pretty close. Feel free to get creative with the filling. You can use peanut butter, ice cream, jam, or whatever your heart desires. It's all up to you, so don't hesitate to give it a shot. So, here's my honest take on the products we've used. Let's start with the vegetable chopper. I didn't showcase all its features in this video because I wanted to experiment with using all the products for different recipes. There's a lot you can do with the vegetable chopper, but it's a bit too much to cover in one video. However, if you'd like to see a dedicated video on the vegetable chopper or recipes using it, just drop a comment below, and I'll make it happen. Now, the pros of the vegetable chopper are that it can indeed chop, slice, and more, just as it's designed to. However, there are a few cons to be aware of. You often need to exert a fair amount of force to cut through vegetables like potatoes, which can make it feel like you might break the tool. Additionally, for specific cuts like dicing, you have to pre-cut the vegetable to your desired thickness before using the chopper, otherwise, it may give you longer cuts. It involves a bit of math and angle considerations, which I had to figure out when making those waffle fries. Fortunately, there are plenty of YouTube tutorials to help you with that. As for the crinkle cutter, I initially found it challenging to cut shapes like waves, waffles, or lattice shapes. However, I eventually got the hang of making crinkle shapes, just as it's meant to be. The process of shaping food is pretty cool, but it can be a bit tricky to figure out, especially for more intricate designs. Luckily, there are plenty of helpful tutorials on YouTube to guide you through it. Now, the Potato Lattice Waffle Maker is the only product out of the three that I really enjoyed using to make waffle fries. However, there's a catch, you have to be extremely careful when using it. It can be quite sharp, and it gave me a little cut once. So, I can't stress this enough, make sure to use the hand protector that comes with the vegetable chopper. Safety first, folks. Now, let's talk about the silicone molds, starting with the Oreo mold. While it does create that iconic Oreo logo, it's not the most efficient option. It's a bit time-consuming to make one cookie at a time, and it can use up a lot of energy, which might show up on your electric bill. I initially thought it was a mold with multiple slots like the others, muffin, donut, and chocolate molds. So, I'd recommend this one primarily if you're really after that authentic Oreo cookie look and feel. If not, it might not be the most practical choice, given the time and energy it consumes. In summary, the muffin, donut, and chocolate silicone molds have proven to be a success, and I'm thrilled with how well they work. I highly recommend these molds for your baking adventures. That's all from me for today. If you have any specific recipes in mind, whether they're low-calorie, high-protein, vegan, or anything else, just drop a comment below, and I'll be more than happy to create them for you. And don't forget to check out Timu, you can find the link in the description box. If you're interested in any of the products mentioned in this video, be sure to use my code, COM99050, at checkout to get an extra 50% off if you're a new app user. Happy cooking!